We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Welcome back, everybody. Now, you may be among the majority of Americans who were taught in school from an early age that Darwinian evolution explains the universe, uh, explains why there is life on Earth, explains why you and I are here. There's nothing else left to question. Maybe you've read a book that cast doubt on creative design and the hand of God in creating the universe by authors like Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris. And perhaps you merely assume that when scientists say that there is a widespread scientific consensus that you conclude that it's really based on evidence. As it turns out, there's a growing reason to challenge uh, this consensus. Today, we have a special guest who's been on the forefront in explaining what science is actually telling us and telling us about God's role in our universe. So, Stephen Meyer, thanks for being on. Uh, it's very nice to be with you. I'll read a quick bio about you so people know who we're talking to here. Um, Stephen Meyer received his, uh, so it's Dr. Stephen Meyer, of course, uh, received PhD from, in philosophy of science from the University of Cambridge, former geophysicist and college professor, now directs the Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture in Seattle. Um, you're known for New York Times bestseller, Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. Another book, Signature in the Cell, DNA and the Evidence for Intelligence Design and Return of the God Hypothesis, which uh, just came out a couple of years ago. Um, all right, Steve, th thanks for being on. Um, you were, you're just on uh, Joe Rogan's show uh, here in the last couple of weeks. And uh, I, I'm sure that was, a, that was an interesting conversation. Um, what did he, we, we were talking about a little bit before, before we, um, before we started, but, you know, you, with me, you're going to get somebody who kind of already agrees with intelligent design. I'm kind of curious what people who, who aren't necessarily sold on that, like, what, what did he challenge you on uh, the most, do you think? Well, um, it was a, a fairly freewheeling conversation. He asked really good probing questions, uh, challenging things. Um, he wanted to know, you know, we were talking about the uh, evidence for design and the fine tuning of the universe. He wanted to know about alternative theories like the multiverse concept. When mm -hmm. I talked about the evidence for uh, the, the multiple lines of evidence we have for the conclusion that the universe had a beginning and therefore... Uh, needed a cause external to itself to bring it into existence. He wanted to know, well, what if what if we find new evidence later in the future that contradicts the evidence that we have? And um, uh, I think it, it, off there, uh, he meant it, the, after we finished, he said, well, you know, this idea of design that you guys have is actually pretty cool, you know. And so he was, I think, receptive to it. But um, he comes, he came in from a more more secular, skeptical point of view, and it was a uh, Good discussion. I think he got the. I I, talk, I talked quite a bit about the the evidence that we have in living cells that they're much more complex than people thought in Darwin's time, and in particular, we've discovered that there's digital code and nano nanotechnology inside cells. I think he got the idea that uh, if you have code, it would have required a programmer of some kind. So. Um, it was it was a pretty wide ranging interview. We also wanted to know about my personal religious background and experience and things like that. So right. uh, he just strikes me as a super inquisitive, very smart guy, and uh, I think very effectively speaks on behalf of uh, uh, the culture in the sense that he's interested in what 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 people in the culture are interested in, and I think that's why he has such a, has a, such a wide following. Oh yeah, oh, I mean, I love the guy. Obviously, and it, um, it's, 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 it sounds like you've been on his show a few times. Yeah, a yeah, few times as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it, it, and it's always fun. Well, well, but okay. So let's 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 let me ask the question a different way though, which is when when people and scientists specifically, um, specifically, I don't know, I don't know what kind of science, whether biologist, geneticist, whoever it would be, who who really focus on the ability of cells to mutate and adapt. I feel like I, I I would imagine they would be your biggest critics, and 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 the and the that would be the most opportunity for a real debate. Um, what would they say to to you and your findings? How do they try to make the case here that that my complex 
body. Well, forget the body. I mean, look at how about just take one part of it. You know, my complex eyeball. One, one. Let's start. Well, start with one little just cell. Little cell. You know, we got tr trillions of cells in our body, but with the big discovery of late 20th century biology is that the simple cell that was thought to be simple by scientists in Darwin's time has turned out not to be simple at all. It's on the or it's an automated factory that's run by digital code. It has nanotechnology, little tiny machines. Uh, uh, a very automated system of information storage, transmission, and processing. This has been a mind-blowing, you know, 50, 60 years in biology as we've un uncovered the what our my colleague uh, or opened what my colleague uh, Michael Behe calls Darwin's black box. We we had no idea the well, we've degree. Known it. We've known it for decades, complexity. though, right? I mean, it's recent, absolutely, but, yeah. but but it's decades at this point. So nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties is when it really started. The, you know, the molecular biological revolution. Right, but that didn't change everybody's mind. There's obviously, st obviously, a lot of scientists still are saying, "Well, but look, that doesn't mean there's intelligent design. It doesn't mean there's God. It just means there's more for us to discover." But it's still an accident. It's still ev evolution. So, like, what, but what's their best? I'm, I'm always curious. What's their best argument? I mean, how, how do you? What's a formidable argument against the idea of intelligence design from their perspective? Yeah, what we first hear in opposition to the idea of intelligent design is that it's not science, that if you're going to be a scientist, you have to limit yourself to strictly materialistic explanations for everything, including the origin of life, the origin of the universe, the uh, origin and nature of human consciousness. All these questions have mm -hmm. to be answered in materialistic terms. Okay, But we already disregard that. My, my response to that is that we already... Uh, offer creative intelligence or intelligent design as an explanation for lots of phenomena in our experience. If you go into the uh, the uh, uh, British Museum and you encounter the Rosetta Stone and you see those three sets of inscriptions representing three different ancient languages in, carved on the rock, you don't limit yourself to strictly materialistic explanations and therefore say, well, it must have been wind and erosion or something like that because you know that it takes a mind to generate information. And so mm -hmm. the, the, the knowledge we have of cause and effect uh, guides the types of inferences that we make and, and, the, and our evaluation of which inferences are most plausible. And one of the things we know from cause and effect is that it does indeed take intelligence to generate informational sequences. There's a famous uh, uh, information theorist who was first applying the tools of information science to analyze the DNA molecule. And he said that the creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. That's something we know from our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning. If we see information in a software program or in a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book or information embedded in a radio signal, and we trace it back to its source, we always come to a mind not a material process. So when the molecular biologists began to discover that inside the DNA molecule and inside every living cell, we have information in a digital form. I mean, Bill Gates has rightly said that DNA is like a software program, but much yeah. more complex than any we've ever written. Uh, it's not a, it's not a difficult uh, it's a very rational conclusion to think that that information also had an intelligent source. Right. And the response to that argument has not been, hey, but we know we have a good materialistic explanation for the origin of, of the information necessary to build the first life. Rather, it's been, no, you can't make that inference because it's not science. It's, it's against the rules. And at that point, we want to say, hey, we need to break some rules. We need the, the fundamental rule of science is to follow the evidence where it most naturally leads. And so rather than getting really um, challenging scientific counter arguments or uh, alternative theories proposed for the things that, that we are arguing point to intelligent design, what we're getting is philosophical responses where people want to say the rules of science forbid you from considering that possibility. Right. And, and that's where I think we, we we need to go back to the original approach to science, which was let's follow the evidence wherever it leads. And let's not we, we don't want to know the best materialistic explanation. We want to know the best explanation, period. And 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 we want to judge which explanation is best by reference to our knowledge and observations of cause and effect processes in the world. And that's how we come to the conclusion of design. Yeah, because it it's 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 a little bit by um process of of elimination i like the rosetta stone analogy that's that's a really good analogy it's like well 
Yeah, because that is, that is the same as arguing, well, we don't know how this ancient carving was created. I mean, we don't have any videotape of it. So could have been a bunch of monkeys. Like, we don't know. I mean, that they, it would be just like saying that, but it would, of course, that would yeah, be. Yeah, no, nobody absurd. says to the archaeologist, yeah, no one says to the archaeologist, oh, that's a scribe of the gaps argument. No, we, we have positive knowledge of what it takes to generate information. We have evidence of an information rich sequence. So we have the evidence of an information rich sequence. We know from experience that information only arises from an intelligent source. When we see information, we can therefore infer backwards, retrodict to a past intelligent cause as the best explanation for that information. And we're using the exact same type of, type of reasoning when we encounter the digital code in the DNA, which was, you know, I, I think one of the great discoveries of, of modern biology, Watson and Crick elucidated the structure of the DNA in 1953, but Francis Crick, who'd been a code breaker in 1957, proposed what's known as the sequence hypothesis. And that was the idea that the the, the chemical subunits that run along the interior of the famed double helix, they're called bases or nucleotide bases, he realized that they were functioning like alphabetic characters in a written text or like zeros and ones in the section of software. And this was this was the beginning of the, in, the information age coming to modern biology. And, and I think people, as you rightly noted, did not all immediately say, oh, it must have been intelligent design, intelligently designed. But the, the discovery of the complexity and indeed the informational complexity of living cells has, has progressively eroded support for standard neo-Darwinian and chemical evolutionary theories. Chemical evolution is the branch of evolutionary theory that attempts to explain the origin of the first life. And these evolutionary approaches are, are, are by now in the 2020s, increasingly uh, facing a kind of impasse. I yeah. attended a conference in 2016 at the Royal Society in London uh, that was convened by a group of evolutionary biologists who are calling for a new theory of evolution. They yeah. know that the neo-Darwinian approach doesn't work. The mechanism of mutation and natural selection has very limited creative power. And the first talk at that conference was a very prominent Austrian evolutionary biologist named Gerd Muller enumerating the... Uh, the explanatory deficits of neo-Darwinism. Now that, that message isn't getting out in the textbooks, but at the highest level of science, people know that this 19th century theory that was updated in the 1930s, that is the neo-Darwinian form of Darwinism, is really not up to explaining the complexity of the cell and the complexity of animals as we find it in late 20th and early 21st century biology. It's just the, the complexity of what we've discovered has surpass the explanatory power of these concepts that were developed now almost in the case of neo-Darwinism almost 100 years ago in the case of Darwinism 160 years ago so, so in, in, in just going back to their their best arguments so their first one is like well it's not science so it doesn't count okay that, that, that's a bit of a cheap shot for for the reasons you you stated um I understand where they're coming from it you know it, it, if you're being super specific and technical about what it means to be doing science, fine, but we're allowed to still use our brains and come up with most likely scenarios. Okay, so, but what else? I mean, because they, they've got, because that's not a good argument. That's not a good counter argument to intelligent design. It's just splitting, it's it's, it's splitting definitional hairs. So do it they is, have- it's, do, it's, You're right, it's, it's but, yeah. But do they have like good it's arguments a, about, I don't know, this, this chemical there, evolution? There are, right, the, yeah, there's two branches of evolutionary theory and there's a slight difference in the context of the debate in each. So. The, Right. The first context is the ex attempt to explain the origin of the first life, the first simple cell from simpler non-living chemicals. And uh, that branch of evolutionary theory is called chemical evolutionary theory, or sometimes called evolutionary abiogenesis, a not life, uh, life from non-life. OK. Mm -hmm. um, and even staunch uh, public spokesman for the Darwinian perspective. Richard Dawkins, for example, even staunch proponents for the evolutionary point of view acknowledge publicly, have acknowledged publicly that we don't know from an evolutionary standpoint how you would get from the chemistry in the in the supposed prebiotic soup to the first living cell. It's just a completely unanswered question. There are people doing research on this. Uh, if you're aware of fellow Texan James Tour, the, ter the terrific organic chemist and nanotechnologist from uh, Rice University. He's been challenging these chemical evolutionary theorists to 
uh, to be more honest with the public about how much we don't know and how little success they've had and how often and in and and in what invasive ways they have to massage their experiments to get the molecules to move in even a slightly life-friendly direction. What the, the logic of simulation experiments, as they're called, is that the present is the key to the past. And what we find when we run simulations trying to figure out, well, if we sparked these gases with, um, with you know, the right electrical discharge, or if we put these chemicals in in combination with these other chemicals, what would happen? Would it lead in a life-friendly direction? Yeah. And it turns out that none of these experiments lead in anything like a suggestive direction unless there's massive interference from the intelligent chemist. The mm -hmm. chemists have to choose already purified chemi chemicals. They do what is called relay synthesis, where they extract the thing they want and then get it in purified form again and, and take it to the next step. So the the, the bottom line is, you can't move chemistry towards code and certainly towards life without intelligent intervention in the laboratory. And we don't get very far even with our, our interventions. Right. But if you need intelligence to make any progress at all, then what are you simulating? Aren't yeah. you actually simulating the need for intelligence yeah. on the ancient earth to make life? Okay. And also, and also so proving that, how, how us being, you know, we're, we're even intelligent beings like ourselves can't even come close. You know, exactly. It, it, exactly. It, it gets to, it gets to a whole other conversation about whether we'll ever be able to create life. You know, if we understand it well enough to see the building blocks, put them together, um, you know, and stack them on top. I, I want to get to that. But so, so what's the other? Um, so, so the third yeah, part, the other right? So context, there's chemical evolution. Yeah. yeah. And then there's biological evolution, and this is what right. Darwin developed the first theory of biological. Well, not the first theory, but his his theory in 1859 really was a game changer at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, and that and bio theories of biological evolution attempt to explain how you get from the first simple cell or what Darwin, Darwin termed one or very few simple forms to all the forms of life we see today, how that very first life morphed and changed over many hundreds of millions and billions of years to produce all the forms we have today, such that you could depict the history of life as a great branching tree where the mm -hmm. base of the tree is that one simple form, the, the, the fingers on the top of the tree or the branches on the top are, represent the giraffes and the elephants and the fishes and all the things we see around us today. And it turns out that, and, and there, are, there are two parts of that theory. One is the historical th a pattern that's depicted, the, the idea that everything is connected in this great branching pattern. And, uh, and the second is the idea that there's a mechanism that generates all the change that is depicted by that tree of life. And that mechanism has uh, was um, in Darwin's time understood as ran, uh, random and natural selections act, act, sorry, natural selection acting on random variations. In the 1930s, we learned about other forms of variation called mutations. And then in the 50s, 40s and 50s, linked that to the idea of changes in genetic material. And so that became known as neo-Darwinism. And the problem with that theory is that first of all, we see a lot of discontinuity in the fossil record. We do not see the, the consistent, the, the, the continuous uh, gradual change that Darwinism uh, affirms. Mm -hmm. We see discontinuity in the genomic record as well with something called orphan genes, and we could come back to that. But then secondly, the mechanism that was proposed to produce the continuous gradual and virtually unlimited amount of change is now increasingly understood by even evolutionary biologists themselves to have very limited creative power. It does a really nice job of explaining small scale variations, mm -hmm. um, the sorts of things we learn about in the textbooks, uh, Galapagos finches with the beaks right. getting a little bigger, a little smaller in response to varying weather patterns, the, the peppered moths whose coloration turned from light to dark and light again in response to varying levels of industrial pollution. But the mechanism does not do a good job of explaining what's called morphological very uh, morphological sorry morphological innovation major changes in biological form especially as they occur very abruptly uh, up and down the rock column in the fossil record and and that's that's the major problem and we can even cash that out in terms of this insight about information we know in the computer or in our computer world that if we've got a section of functional digital code say for a a program or an operating system, that the code may abide a few random changes, but if you make too many changes, you're going to degrade and lose the function you have long before you ever come to a new program or operating system. Mm 
mm-hmm. as the uh, as the random changes in the in the a's or sorry in the zeros and ones accumulate, you're gonna you're gonna destroy eventually you're gonna destroy function. And it turns out that the same thing is true in the in the living world. If a section of a gene for building a protein is a long section of of genetic characters, which we represent with the letters A, C, G, and T. If we start changing those genetic characters at random by mutation, and this is the Darwinian, neo-Darwinian idea, the same exact thing occurs as occurs in the computer realm. You can, the, 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 the string of characters will abide a, a certain number of change, random changes, but then after a very small number, it will lose the ability to produce a, a stable structure called a, pro, a, a protein fold. And at that point, no, no function is possible. And therefore there's nothing for the evolutionary process to, to select. So there's a strict limit on how much change right down to the protein level that that mutation natural selection mechanism can generate. And that's just one of the really fundamental problems with invoking mutation and natural selection as the creative engine right. of biological innovation. It's just not an adequate mechanism. You would think that's kind of intuitive. I mean, you know, you, you you can because without knowing a ton about evolutionary biology, I think you can intuitively understand <laughs> just through common sense um, that all right, you, you you can see how some a, some adaptations might occur, uh, like you said, an elongated beak, a, a shorter beak, whatever it is. Um, now, now, do we still think that? those kind of changes in in a, in a species biology are in fact due to what is, if I'm explaining Darwinism correctly, these sort of accidental mutations that happen to benefit the, the individual that had the mutation, they reproduce more because they're stronger, they're better, they're, they're better off for that mutation. And so it becomes more prevalent within that species. Is that basically yeah, what we, evolution we, is? The- yeah, those of us who are proponents of intelligent design recognize that natural selection is a real process, yeah. that mutations occur, and that that uh, certain mutations can confer a limited benefit on an organism. Oftentimes, the mutations that are, are uh, most readily beneficial are degradative. They mm-hmm. result in a loss of some information or uh, structure, but in certain circumstances, that can be beneficial. Um, you don't really want to have sickle cell anemia, but in certain climates, it's actually advantageous and gives you mm-hmm. immunity against other things, you know? So, so there are these kind of degradative mutations that are very common and, and are, and are selected by the process of natural selection. So natural selection and random mutation is a real process. We just think it has limited scope, limited creative power. And, and interestingly, it's not just proponents of intelligent design who are saying that and recognizing that. Yeah. Uh, people within the field of evolutionary biology are doing so. And that's why there are calls for a new theory of evolution. Can we talk about what it takes to build life? Um, and this, this could, because it is actually a bit important for your argument to, to understand you know, how many proteins are required to fit into, I, I mean, I, I, maybe you can help visualize it for us. Like, no, it's kind of so, awesome when you, when, you break, when you break it down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we'll just start with the first, you know, simple, simple cell in the, the 19th first, century. The first thing that has to happen for life to be created. Yeah. Like, what's right. the first thing? A bunch of proteins get together and talk. But, like, what happens? Yeah. So there, there are these uh, basic classes of biomolecules that are necessary to sustain to su- sustain a cell. You need lipids, which are the molecules, the fatty molecules that create the membrane um, that encloses all the metabolic processes inside the cell. Then you need proteins and proteins are the really the crucial molecules in a way because they perform almost all the important biochemical uh, or metabolic reactions. And they, uh, many proteins are enzymes which catalyze reactions at super fast rates that wouldn't occur otherwise. Um, the proteins also uh, build the structural parts of the miniature machines that we find in cells. Uh, the, 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 the sliding clamps, the little w- w- walking robotic motor proteins that tow vesicles along uh, mm-hmm. tracks that take the ma- materials from one part of the cell to another. Um, you also have proteins for processing information. So you've got, you've got the lipids to make the enclosure. You've got the proteins to do the, all the jobs. You have to have nucleic acids, DNA and RNA to build the proteins. And interestingly, you need proteins to process the information on the DNA. So you've got a chicken and egg. You also have crucial um, 
molecules for uh, for storing energy. Um, and these are the ATP molecules, a little, in a sense, the power plants or the battery packs of the cell. And then a, another whole class of molecules are the, the carbohydrates or the sugars. And we now know that in addition to the DNA code, there's actually a sugar code, that sugars store information and are involved in intracellular signaling in multicellular organisms. So if you want to build, uh, if you want to build life, you have to, at the very, at the very least, build those four classes of molecules, but not just any version of them. They have to be very specifically configured or arranged. In the case of the DNA, you have to have very specific instructions for building the exact proteins that are needed. Uh, and there are uh, a vast, huge, exponentially huge number of ways of going wrong, of arranging, even if you have all those parts, arranging them in the right way is also prohibitively difficult. And, and this and is the so, simplest cell. In the simplest cell, uh, could you have a, do we have like a number of like how many elementary molecules exist in, a, in the simplest yeah, of there, cells? Yeah, people have done experiments on that. And, and anywhere between 250 and 400 proteins are thought to be necessary for a minimally complex cell. And a minimally complex cell is going to have to perform various metabolic processes. It's going to have to be able to store, transmit, and process information. It's going to have to be able to copy itself, be capable of self-replication. Uh, so uh, now there are origin of life theories that say, well, you can do away with all that and just start with a self-replicating RNA molecule. RNA is interesting because it can catalyze a few of the reactions that some proteins catalyze. Um, although it doesn't have nearly the sophistication of an actual protein in, in so doing. And uh, and it can store information like DNA. So some people have said you can get away from this chicken and egg problem of needing DNA to build the proteins and needing the proteins to process the information on the DNA by proposing a kind of aboriginal RNA molecule that was that's capable of self-replicating. But interestingly, there's numerous problems with that hypothesis, but one that is very interesting from the standpoint of the importance, the primacy of information to life. When scientists have tried to design, and notice the word design, a self-copying RNA molecule, the best they've been able to do is get one that'll copy about 10% of itself. Yeah. And only then if they themselves intelligently arrange the, the, the information carrying subunits on the RNA called the bases. And so again, they end up simulating the need for intelligence to generate information to move in a life-friendly direction. And so you get that same problem of simulating the very thing they, they want not to simulate. They wanna show that life could have arisen in an undirected, unguided materialistic process. And invariably they need to use their own minds to move things in a direction that, that in some weak way simulates the origin of life. Yeah. And it's also like, you know, we're not, we're not so backwards that we can't imagine where we could be. Does that make sense? You know, just uh, we're at that sure, point in, sure. in, 20, in 2023 that like, I, I think 2000 years ago was probably pretty hard for the smartest people on earth to, to imagine where we're at now with, with, with digital landscape and all that. I, I, I'm not so sure that we're incapable of imagining what we might discover. I think we can imagine it, right? I think our our sci-fi brains are are, are can, can work pretty well, um, just just based on our current knowledge of the universe. I could be totally wrong, wrong about that. I mean, just like people. Oh, it's a good years intuition. Ago, no, absolutely. We're, yeah, we're, we're totally wrong about it, but like we can kind of see what's discoverable. Is my point, and and so it's it's just it's just so hard to see how we eventually discover how to manipulate these um to even do it ourselves but let alone uh prove that just through a series of very unlikely accidents and um that it just happened by itself without any of us messing with it <laughs> um it's it's just impossible uh to to see it that way again without even knowing a whole lot about molecular biology so this is kind of why i've always subscribed to the to the to the to the belief of intelligent design i, I do have a question what um so based on how you see things i mean how far have it have how what's what's your theory on on how different we were human beings were however long ago right so so darwinian evolution says we came from monkeys like, and, and and that was because of adaptations or whatever. I mean, what what do you say? How do you think that happened? Because you did mention a couple times these sort of in the archaeology and uh, in the fossil record that there's these sort of jumps. 
So can you explain that? And, and it is, it, are we one of those jumps? Right, right. If you don't mind indulging me, I just wanted to tell a quick story about your your comment before you asked the question, because yeah. um, I, I did my PhD uh, on origin of life biology in a interdisciplinary program in Cambridge. And my one of my supervisors had written a fairly definitive history on the whole field of origin of life research. And so I, I finished my PhD in 1990, and she came back from the the ISOL conference, which was the International Society for the Study of the Origin of Life mm -hmm. in 1989. And so this was nearly 35 years ago now. And she said, our field is becoming populated by, by um, odd bods and cranks. She said, everybody knows that everybody else's theory isn't working, but no one will admit <laughs> it about their own. And so you've had this, there are still a few people doing serious origin of life research, but the problem is so difficult that it's not a field that many up and coming scientists want to go in because they know essentially everything we know about the chemistry shows that the molecules do not want to organize themselves into structures that are going to be relevant to, to living systems. Right. Chemistry just, just doesn't just do that on its own. It's just not going to happen. It's, it's, it's just not there's just nothing happen. we know about chemistry that suggests that the molecules will organize themselves into a cell. And, and so this is, you know, it's kind of a, for that reason, increasingly dead end field of research. Okay, so, but you asked another question. Uh, yeah, um, the second second book I, the first book I wrote was Signature in the Cell about the origin of life problem. The second one was is called Darwin's Doubt, and it's about the origin of animal life. And one of the uh, uh, major events in the history of life where you suddenly get um, a whole suite of new forms of animal life arising abruptly in the fossil record. It's in a period in the fossil record called the Cambrian. The event is called the Cambrian explosion. And what's, what happens is that you get this, you know, two or three dozen new body plans where a body plan is a unique arrangement of, uh, of body parts and tissues exemplified in a living form. And yeah. you get you know, you get all these new, new, new forms of life, the iconic trilobites, the arthropods, the first fishes, a comb jellies, a kind of derms. It, it's just boom. You've got all this, this new life. And uh, within a, with, I say boom, but that's within a narrow window, geologically speaking, an accepted date yeah. would be 10 million years. I showed that between 13 and 16 new body plans arise in even a more narrow 6 million year window in my book. And it turns out that that abrupt appearance of new form is not by any means the only one that's occurred in the history of life, that the abrupt mm. appearance of new form is actually the rule, not the exception in paleontology. And so a few years after I wrote this book, I wrote an, a long article with a German paleontologist, Gunter Beckley, who had been the curator of the uh, 2009 Bicentennial Darwin exhibition at the largest natural history museum in Europe, the Stuttgart Museum of Natural History, Beckley subsequently became a Darwin skeptic and, and by 2017 had become a proponent of intelligent design, first-rate paleontologist. And in this article, we identified 19 major abrupt appearances or what paleontologists used to call saltations or explosions of new forms of life the first winged insects, the first turtles, the first dinosaurs, the first birds, the first flowering plants, the first mammals. You just go up and down the rock column and you find th this type of abrupt appearance. So, so Stephen Jay Gould, as far back as 1980, said that, that the, the, this abrupt appearance and what he called stasis, that is to say, uh, no directional change in the form of organisms over long periods of time, is was the rule, and also he said it was the it was the trade secret of paleontology. Paleontologists know about this, but since it doesn't conform to the Darwinian tree of life picture, yeah. uh, it's been well, but, largely. But, but, but is it possible? I mean, I, I can assume what the counter argument would be if somebody who who's a, more of a Darwin fan um, they, they would say, well, okay, just because you you lack the information showing that evolution doesn't mean it's not there. Um, how, yeah, how the, 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 yeah, the old saw is the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. But uh, notice that this is a gaps argument. This is, you know, people holding out for for something that the fossil record has repeatedly failed to document. Hmm. And there's also they're, 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 they are doing what they accuse uh, more religious people of doing. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah, exactly. They want to say that people are arguing for intelligent design or making a god of the gaps or an intelligence of the gaps argument. In science, you always, all inferences are provisional, 
we always have to be open to new evidence, but you also have to look at the trend line for evidence. And we've had 160 years since Darwin to look for these uh, intermediate forms. And what we found is rather than the, the gaps that were unfilled in Darwin's time being filled in by new fossil discoveries, what we found time and time again is the discovery of new forms of life for which there are more, for which there's more morphological disparity, more gaps. So the gap, the, 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 the picture of discontinuity and morphological isolation has become more and more pronounced over time. Yeah. And there are even statistical ways of measuring the completeness of the fossil record that show that we're, we are approaching a very complete picture. Uh, and so it's unlikely that this picture is going to be overturned. An, an illustration would be reaching into a big a big barrel and pulling out marbles. And if after you know a hundred times you only get red, blue, and white, um, well then it's going to you you may be get starting to get confident that yeah. there's only red, blue, and white in there. <laughs> and if after a, a thousand times you still only get red, blue, and white, then you're getting more and more with with each successive series of picks. You're getting more and more confident that you're getting a true picture right. of the pattern. Well, so, so that's what I think is going on in paleontology. So what? Um, but let's go back to humans. So you know we have sure. um, we have old Neanderthal skulls, and they look quite different from you and me. So what what is what is that? Are they? And, and I suppose this is kind of important from a religious perspective too. I mean, I'm a Christian. Um, you know, I I believe in intelligence. I've always. I've always defaulted to intelligent design just as, as my belief system. That's sort of where I landed without knowing anything that you're even talking about. Okay. <laughs> because, <laughs> okay. because I, I just, I just think it's intuitive. Um, and I've always thought of science as I think it describes the world the best it can, but it never explains a single thing. It has yet to explain why the universal constant is the universal constant. There's no explanation. There's a description and these are two different words and they have to be separated. Um, oh, you're, you're singing a very important song for me is my background was in physics. And if you talk about, for example, Newton, Newton appreciated this, what, the point you're making. Right. Uh, he, he wanted people. That's pressed what Newton's laws are. He's, just, he's describing yeah, behavior, their descriptions, he's not explaining it. Yeah, no. And he was pressed to explain, well, what causes gravitational attraction? You've got the moon up there and the tides down here. They're not touching each other. There's no pushing and pulling. How is it that the moon is exerting a force across that distance and causing water to move on planet Earth? He said, hypothesis non fingo. I don't feign to know the cause. I'm only describing mathematically what I see happening. Right. I can't tell you what causes it. So and it, and I, I most, think there are causal science... explanations in science, but not not everywhere we think, you know, the well, fundamental sure. force laws in physics. Yeah, yeah not, not to the fundamental. There's not. I mean, no, no, because I, I, look, the more we know about science, the more causality we derive, but it just takes you another layer and another layer and another layer. And there is the immovable mover concept, right? I mean, you're, you're a doctorate in philosophy. <laughs> you, you know, there's the, and that's that's what brings me to God is the immovable mover. Like at some point, there has to be a finality to to that 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 causal that chain of causality that we see. And I don't care how much we figure it out. You're never going to find the ultimate creator unless it's God. Like, I just, I, I just don't uh, see another way. Well, Congressman, do you, rem do you remember the, um, the book that was published by uh, Robert Jastrow uh, called God and the Astronomers famous book. And it was, a, it's a while back now. It was the 1980s, but he was a famously agnostic astrophysicist. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he was very open about what he thought the, obvious implications of the the evidence for the big bang were and that is that uh the, if if the best evidence we have suggests that matter space time and energy began a finite time ago then before that there was no time and and therefore there was also no matter to do the causing and so you get back to ultimately to a first cause a need for a first cause that cannot be material and so he thought that the the new cosmology had obvious theistic implications, yeah. and uh, he didn't like it much. He said, "I'm an agnostic. I I wish it weren't true. I don't know how to make sense of it." But this seems to be where the evidence is pointing. And he had this famous passage at the end of the of his book where he talked about this. The the story ends for the scientist like a bad dream. He's ch he's chasing the chain of cause and effect back and back and back to the final, and he gets to the final, um, you know outcome he's he's climbing the 
the highest peak. He scales it. He pulls himself over the mountain and he discovers a band of theologians who have been waiting there for centuries. He said <laughs> it was a very famous final you know, line to his book. So I like um, that. But, and, that, and that's sort anyway, of a lot of us come yeah. to it. You know, I talked to Dennis Prager. I'm sure you know, it, we, we've had that conversation. Like, that's how we both come to religion. It's not it, it's not some feeling I have. Like, I wish it was um, in some ways, but it's it's definitely more scientific. I think science leads us to this without without question. OK, but I, but I still want to focus in on the, the question about- You want to go back to humans. What, yeah, humans. humans. Like, right. yeah. what were we? When did we become human? I mean, what do you, what do you think Adam, the story of Adam and Eve is is describing? Um, so first I should issue a proviso. I work the other end of the time scale, first mm -hmm. life, origin of animal life. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 3.85 billion years before we get on the scene for the first life. You know, the first animals are 500 million yeah. years before that. I mean, I'm into cosmology, which is even further back. So I don't do a lot of work on human origins, just, I have, but I have a, uh, more than passing, uh, avocational interest in it because I'm interested in origins generally. Yeah. Uh, and there are a couple of things I, I definitely would say. The first is that the Darwinian mechanism, we now know whether there was a, a, a continuous sequence of, um, a, a, of descent with modification from some earlier forms of hominids to ourselves, or whether there was a discontinuous origin to human beings. Um, in other words, a, a special creation. Uh, the one thing we know is that Darwinian mechanism lacks the creative power to to produce the amount of new form and structure and information that would be necessary to build a human right. being from uh, an anatomically from an modern human being from, from a hom from a hominid of some kind. Okay, right. and this has been actually tested by um, some. There's a very rigorous. Um, uh, way of evaluating the creative power of the mutation selection me uh, mechanism that's called that waiting times analysis or the waiting times problem. There's a branch of evolutionary biology called uh, population genetics that uh, allows us to calculate how much evolutionary change should occur in a given amount of time, or conversely, how much time it would take for a given amount of evolutionary change to take place if we know certain factors, the mutation rate, the time from parent to offspring, the generation time, and the population sizes. And when people have done waiting times analysis on the sort of um, uh, origin of humans from the last common ancestor to us and chimps, it turns out that the waiting times, the best case waiting times analysis shows that it the, the, the mutation selection mechanism would, would take between 200 million and maybe as much as a billion years. And yet the point of divergence was allegedly only five to 6 million years ago. So in other words, not enough time for mutation and selection to do the creative work it would need to do to generate one of us from one of them, okay? Right. Um, now, so that's, to me, that's, that's, that's a, a, uh, an, another instance of this problem of the lack of creative power. And so we don't really have a theory of evolution that explains new form. Right. And, and um, so, that's in my wheelhouse. I'll go to the mat to defend that conclusion. The other thing that I think is quite striking is that we have um, a very striking disparity in the fossil record between genus um, Homo and the Australo, the Australopithecines and the Homo erectus, or then later forms of, of, of our genus. So there's a huge gap there from the standpoint of the fossil record. And then there's another striking gap in what you might call the paleoanthropological record. And that is what paleoanthropologists call the big bang of human cultural evolution. That representational art, the first, the first writing, the first agriculture, the first cities, these all arise very recently within the last few tens of thousands of years, not millions of years. Right. And so you have to ask the question if about some of those early alleged hominids, if they had our higher cognitive capability, why was there no evidence of writing sophisticated, uh, arc, you know, no cities, or, no agriculture, yeah. no, no writing. So uh, there's a really very good essay on this in a book that we did critiquing the concept of theistic evolution written by my colleague, Casey Luskin, who shows that you have these two big discontinuities the anatomical discontinuity that arises with genus Homo 
and then the evidence of a cognitive discontinuity that arises relatively recently. Uh, and and I would associate that that big bang of human cultural evolution to our species. And because it's so abrupt, I'm quite open myself in my personal belief to think that that might be exactly what the Genesis account is talking about with this with the special creation of human beings. Yeah, we are. Yeah, I I, I say the same thing often. I I don't say it like you said it, <laughs> but but what I um, because I don't know all the, the 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 scientific jargon to to say it like that. But I totally agree. I think I think Genesis is referring to the creation of consciousness you know, as we know it, right. As, as, as in God's image of, well, you can't, you can't possibly image God's consciousness, but I've always thought about it that way. If I'm going to come up I think, with, like I think a, that's a good way to think about it, you know, because uh, what, what, what God is endowing with to human beings is his, his self-awareness, his creativity, free will, what may yeah. free will, what makes him, you know, the, 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 uh, cognitive, mental, spiritual, capabilities that he, uh, or or attributes that he has that right. he has that make us like him in a way that's different from all the other animals of of, of the creation uh, you'd asked about the joe rogan uh conversation i had one of the things that came up was uh this whole issue of the origin of language in the discussion mm -hmm. and this is one of those uh, he asked me if i thought that humans were the the in some way the pinnacle of creation and uh, I maybe should have answered more directly and just said yes, I do. But I, what I what I said was that I I think it's certainly the case that there are qualitative differences between humans and all other forms of animals, and uh, you know it's we who study the chimpanzees and their capability or lack thereof to use language. It's not the chimpanzees that study us. Um, you know there are there are animals with impressive. Uh, um, you know, mental, they're, sm they're smart, they're smart mammals, uh, any dog owner knows that. But there is a qualitative difference between the capabilities that human ha humans have, and even the smartest forms of, of, of mammals. And one of them has to do with language. And there's, this, you put a, a three year old, a child, and a, and, a, and, a, and a smart dog, and a smart cat in the room, and expose them to all the same stimuli, and you know, or, or you, you know, an infant of all three. By the time the child is three years old, uh, the child is saying amazing things using extraordinary, extraordinarily complex verb tenses. Uh, there seems to be, as Chomsky, the great linguist, uh, uh, argued, a universal grammar and a and a and an innate capability in human beings to learn language. And one of the points I made in the conversation with Rogan is that uh, we might be able to give a, a sort of simplistic evolutionary account of the origin of nouns or maybe some simple verbs we could imagine this is what bf skinner the the uh, uh behaviorist psychologist imagined he had a behaviorist theory of the origin of language that you know right. you and i are you know on the african savanna and we're grunting and pointing and uh you know that we say red and and okay so that, well but even that's difficult because if i don't already have a symbol convention um then how do I know when I'm pointing at a red tree whether I mean the bark, the tree, or the color? It, it's 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 difficult even to get nouns and verbs. But the point I made to Mr. Rogan was just, uh, and then this was Chomsky's point: How do you get in that stimulus response vein that, that the behaviorist imagined? How do you get from? Uh, how do you get to something like the subjunctive tense? What I would have done or what I could have done, or the imperative, what I should have done, how do you convey that by, by simple pointing and grunting? That, it, it doesn't work. And yeah. instead, what we find is that all, all members of the human race, across all people groups, at a very young age, have the capacity to learn language with all those richness, all the richness of those different verb tenses, the different ways we use nouns, the different ways of putting sentence structure together. This seems to be innate and children pick it up in their own mother tongue at a very young age in a way that no animal can do. We also use mathematics. We put on shows. We uh, we have concepts of honor and fame. We uh, it, You just go down the list. It's uh, We do science. We do art. Um, there are qualitative it's, differences it's not between even us and human beings. Yeah, it's it's not even close. close. You know, yeah. no no animal builds cities. 
You know, we don't have we don't have road systems underwater. Dolphins are clearly smart. Orca whales, wonderful. Uh, I love all those creatures. But as smart as they are, there, there's there's nothing that rivals things that we take for granted that only humans can do. And so, what, 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 uh, and what, what, that what those is... capabilities arise recently and abruptly in in our paleoanthropological and archaeological record. What, what is your personal journey through all this? Um, your belief in God, your 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 religious affiliation. How, how did you come through this throughout your life? Yeah, well, th thanks for asking. I, um, I I got turned on to all these scientific evidences first for intelligent design, and then I, as I made the case in my most recent book, Return of the God Hypothesis, for a designer who has the attributes that Jews and Christians have long ascribed to God, to a theistic designer. Mm -hmm. I, I was first exposed to those evidences in my mid-20s at a, a, a very important conference. But <clears throat> I I had a fairly long prior to that, um, a somewhat tortuous conversion experience starting in my mid-teens. Um, I had um, in my yeah, yeah, in my mid-teens, I was having a kind of experience of angst, which I didn't know what to call. Um, I, just a series of questions that were unwelcome questions popping into my mind. Uh, how do I know what I'm seeing is really out there? What's it going to matter in 100 years? I could see the routine of life every day repeating. It didn't seem... It was going anywhere. We're working towards something, but I knew that eventually we all died. So what could we possibly achieve that would have any lasting meaning or value? Mm -hmm. um, worries about time. I could see events moving by in this steady stream. Didn't seem to be any particular event that had any lasting meaning or value. It <clears throat> just one thing happened after another. Uh, I had this strange sense that there had to be something that didn't change or else everything that was changing was not in any way lasting. It was all ephemeral. It was all shifting sand. And and so then I began to worry. These thoughts scared me because I didn't know how to answer them. I was only 14 at the time. Um, I was fairly unpopular, nerdy sort of kid at school. Um, I was had great ambitions for, for being a basketball star. And I was only uh, I was only 98 pounds and <laughs> sitting on the bench, you know, it's just like mm -hmm. everything was going wrong in my life. And I was having these terrible questions and I broke my leg and was in a leg cast, had plenty of time for my mind to spin out of control. But I began to worry that that there was something wrong with me. I, I, I had this terrifying thought that this must be what it means to be insane, to have thoughts like this. And so uh, long story short, uh, I did a year or two later, crack open the big white family Catholic Bible, began, it fell open to the, the, the page between the Testaments. There was a wonderful, very manly picture of Jesus of Nazareth. And I began to read the New Testament. And I found as I was reading, I had I knew kids at school who were having these ecstatic uh, born again experiences. What I what started to happen to me was I started to encounter passages in the Bible, both in the New Testament and the Old Testament, that seemed to address these weird questions I was having and seemed to give answers to them. And later when I got to college, I realized, I learned, I was, took a lot of philosophy and realized that some of the questions I were, was asking were, they were basically philosophical questions, the same sort of thing that, yeah. for example, the atheist existentialist philosophers were, were asking. I remember in a sophomore philosophy class telling one of my professors, oh, those Weird that all that worry I had as a, a teenager, I wasn't insane. I was just a philosopher. And he chuckled and said, well, there's a fine line between insanity and philosophy. But um, the basic answer is that the, in, the, in the Bible, I found a worldview framework that answered questions that I needed for a stable psychological structure I, to, to be normal. So I, had, I knew kids at school were having these ecstatic conversion experiences. And what happened to me is that as I learned more and more about, about Christianity and, and the Old Testament and the Bible, that I started to feel normal because I thought, oh, these are not such weird questions and there are answers to them and they are found in this religious framework. And, and then later, uh, you know, in my 20s, when I was working as a, a scientist and more and only recently settled in my Christian convictions, I encountered these scientists who were having 
intellectual conversions to theism or intelligent design because of some of the evidences that I discuss in my my books today. And that put me on a kind of a life's mission to to uh, develop those arguments and, and learn more about them. Right. And develop them from a from a scientific point of view, because I think the people who are just are not there's a lot of people who are just not emotionally drawn to religion. And I wouldn't even say I'm emotionally drawn to it. Uh, I just think it has to be true. Uh, you know, based on explanations I've, I've, I've said, I, I was emotionally. Un, yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, just a little lag there, but um, yeah, I was emotionally undrawn to it through college. I didn't want it to be true, but I had become convinced philosophically that it must be true, and yeah. so there was a kind of a tension for a while until I settled, and then it was soon after I settled that I started meeting these interesting scientists who were. Um, talking about the digital code and DNA and the yeah. discovery of the fine tuning of the universe and the, uh, and, and the evidence we had uh, for, I, I was at a conference with Alan Sandage, the great cosmologist who gave a lecture on the big bang. And then he finished and said, here is evidence for what can only be described as a super natural event. This, there's no way this could have been predicted within the realm of physics. This is the origin of physics itself itself you know right. so before that we can't give a physical explanation for the origin of physics it must be something beyond it it must be something supernatural right. so or, that blew uh, my mind i mean he was edwin hubble's grad student and he had recently converted uh, he, he was an agnostic jew who had had a conversion experience to christianity and at this conference he explained how the scientific evidence that he was studying in cosmology was one of the key factors he, he became a believer in God because of, not in spite of, the scientific evidence. So similar to yeah. what you were saying. Right. And it's it's frustrating when you deal with, you know, the so-called scientific consensus on evolution and people sort of talk talk down at you and say, well, I mean, you don't believe in evolution. You know, it's like, well, first of all, it's a theory. OK, so right, it's, it, right. it, it, it's not like asking someone, well, you, you, do you believe in trees? I mean, I mean, yes, I believe in trees. They're there. But like. You know, it's they they attach this sort of authority to evolution when in itself is simply a theory, um, and a, you know a very difficult one to prove for all the for all the reasons you you've stated. Um, there's 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 a real condescension to to the conversation and a real attempt to I think bully people out of the conversation, you know, and and uh, degrade the idea of religion or the idea of God. You know, they'll say things like, "Well, I mean, I just don't believe in magic." Well, I mean, okay, I mean, but 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 somehow but, well, we. <laughs> but do you do you believe in agency? Do you believe that that minds have causal powers that yeah. material the matter doesn't? And we show by our actions, all of us, atheists and theists alike, that we believe that minds can do things that 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 purely material processes can't. And we know there's signatures that mental agents leave behind. One of which is information. No one would look at a at uh you know great well, we would look at richard dawkins's masterpiece the blind watchmaker and not think that it had been written by a very intelligent biologist even if he may be wrong in his conclusions clearly the information on the page is evidence of agency so we know we have ways of recognizing the activity of mind so this isn't mysterious this is part of the world uh and one of the great is and they always kind of default to this like well look we just don't know yet but we will find out and that goes back to my my assertion that I'm like, well, then you you have to at least lay out a roadmap to how you would find out. You know, right. we're, we're we're not that stupid, okay? Like we're we're we would at least be able to say, look, if we could figure out how X, Y, and Z works, then it would they would disprove the existence of God. You know, but they don't really offer that. Like that that's that's I don't I don't think I'm I'm I'm, I'm I'm straw manning their arguments here. I, I think there's really no theory as to how God wouldn't exist. <laughs> Well, and I, I remember I, in, in my twenties, I was at a conference at uh, Yale on the on the question of it was called the mind body problem. You know, do do humans uh, um, are are all of our choices and thoughts determined by the neurochemistry of our brains, or do we actually have minds that control the way the brain works? Mm -hmm. And I was interviewing one of the great uh, neuroscientists of the twentieth century, Sir John Eccles, and he called this strategy you're you're describing promissory materialism. It's, it's materialism of the gaps. We don't know, but someday we'll find out because it has to be. It just has to be a materialistic answer. Well, why? Because we know in the world around us, we have two things. We have matter, but we also have minds. Right. And uh, there's great atheistic philosopher, Thomas Nagel, who 
uh, probably unfortunately for him, commended one of my books, Signature in the Cell, in 2009 in a London newspaper, and then was attacked by all, all his fellow atheist philosophers. But he doubled down, and in 2012, he wrote his own book called Mind and Cosmos, how the neo-Darwinian materialist account of reality is almost certainly false, was the long <laughs> subtitle. And, he, and the big point of the book was, if we, we there, are, there are two things in mind. There's the cause in the universe, there's the physical cosmos, but then there are also self-conscious agents or minds that inhabit it. And if we have a theory of origins that can't account for the origin of mind, then we have a seriously impoverished view of reality. And he, in the end, stayed an atheist. He, he didn't think he had a satisfactory answer to the problem, or he proposed something that maybe wasn't all that satisfactory. But he said, neo-Darwinism is not it. It's it's not giving a full account of reality. So, yeah. and I think, I think you know, th there is a great shift taking place. I think um, in, you know, the heyday of the, of the new atheism was 2007, the publication of The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. We're now 15 years beyond that. And we're seeing lots of high level of conversion, scientific conversions to the idea of intelligent design. I think there's an increasing dissatisfaction with that rabid sort of new atheist uh, philosophy that says that science has made belief in God untenable. And um, and, and I think a, 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 an in, a, a great increase in interest in the God question right at the center of the culture, which in part, I experienced uh, just a couple of weeks ago with the invitation to speak on the Joe Rogan experience, which has you know these massive number, to, I guess some 10 million downloads. Um, I, the, I think the, the very fact that he was willing to have me on is is a, an indicator of something that's going on in the culture. I think people sense the wheels are coming off in various ways, and maybe we need to reconsider that belief system that we not that long ago revered and now have kind of rejected with he, he advancing must have secularism. Asked you, he must have asked you. I don't know if he did because I didn't get a chance to listen to the podcast, but uh, he must have asked you what your reaction would be if we discovered alien life forms, especially intelligent ones that are visiting us in these funny little crafts. What, um, how, how would that change things yeah. for us? Yeah, he asked me what I thought about that. I told him I, I don't really know what, you know, I have made no evaluation as to any of those uh, reports that, you know, the Navy released or whatever, but um, I where the and this is why I, I told him where the the discussion about alien life forms intersects the subject that, that I work on was the origin of life is that there are leading scientists who have actually proposed a theory of intelligent design that uh, involves uh, intelligent aliens designing and seeding life on planet Earth. The theory is called panspermia. No less a scientific genius than Francis Crick himself actually proposed this in a book called Life Itself in 1981. Mm -hmm. He later then um, regretted it and said he would hazard no more hypotheses about the origin of life. It was simply too difficult a problem. But he realized that the conditions weren't right on planet Earth, so he had to come up with some sort of explanation. Richard Dawkins actually floated it in an interview with Ben Stein in, uh, in the film Expelled that came out in 2008 or 2009. Um, and then he also uh, later uh, disclaimed his own statements because I think he he regretted saying it. But there have been some very prominent scientists who have said, hey, we see evidence of design in the cell. D Dawkins called it a signature of design. Um, but it can't. It, so but it's got to be a designer that arose through some purely explicable naturalistic process on some other planet. Yeah. So we have uh, it's it's not a very good hypothesis because even to get the evolutionary process going on another planet, you need to account for the origin of information. Right. You're, you're just, you're just all... changing. You're just changing the location of the scenario. You're not, yeah, you're not the explaining problem, yeah. anything because it, it's kind of like a yeah. simulation theorist. It's like, well, maybe we're just on big one big simulation. I'm like, okay, fine. Well, then who created yeah. the simulator? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the simulator is just another name for God. Then at that point, you know, yeah. oh, we we yeah. don't seem to be able to get around the need for a higher intelligence to account for what we're seeing, both in biological and in cosmological origins. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess my answer would be, okay, fine. Let's, let's say aliens land here tomorrow and they're, they look really funny. I don't know. Maybe they look just like us. Who knows? I mean, I, what's my explanation? I guess God created them too. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Well, right. <laughs> what do you want me to say? <laughs> like you, I also, in, in personal belief, I am, I am a Christian. I don't think the, I think the Bible is, does not tell us one way or another, whether there was, there were other creatures made in God's image made somewhere else in, in the in the vast universe. I think we can afford to be completely agnostic aw awaiting further further evidence on that. I don't think it's a question that bears one way or another on the truth of 
of of theism or the Bible. If there's a God, he could have created uh, another uh, another species that has our kind of endowments or higher, perhaps. If uh, if the God is the God uh, revealed through the Judeo Christian scriptures, there's nothing in those scriptures that tells us one way or another whether he did so. The great Christian apologist uh, C.S. Lewis speculated about other uh, creatures who had been made in God's image, but who hadn't fallen or rebelled against him in his famous, uh, uh, Lewis wrote about this in his famous space trilogy. So I think it's a, yeah. it's a question. It's not a question that uh, we need to go to the mat for one way or another. And I'm completely right. open to whatever the evidence shows. Yeah. If it happens, it happens. Okay. One last thing is we've got kind of gone over time and I have to head to a, a another meeting, but um, I, I do want to ask, cause I was, I was briefly going through a lot of your uh, writings, um, you write about sort of the conversations about multiverse theory and how that applies here. Um, and again, I didn't, I didn't dive too much into it. So I'm curious where that fits in. So, I mean, there's physicists who believe that in order to explain, uh, you know, the, the, the eeriness of quantum mechanics, that one of the th possible theories is multiverse theory, which if, if I'm correct, stems from the idea that because, um, you know, elementary particles have a sort of a probab probabilistic curve of well, well, where they will be in time and space, um, that that allows for a basically exponential number of, of universes um, because they, they could they can go one way or the other unless we actually observe them and, and test them, right? That's a sort of a crude way, I think, of explaining it. That's, that's not too bad at all. There's, a, there's a, um, a mathematics that describes all the possible locations of, for example, a... Um, a um, an electron. If, if you have you have a spreading waveform, once an observation is made, that spreading wave, waveform will manifest itself in a particular location. And there's a branch of, of um, uh, physics called quantum mechanics that describes the probability associated with all the different possible locations that that that, that waveform once observed could adopt. And one of the interpretations of that mathematics is to say that well every one of those possibilities described by the math corresponds to a reality in another universe. Um, and so that's one way you get to the idea of other universes. Another way is um, there, there is uh, there, there's a problem with this called fine tuning. You have these all these different parameters of physics that are very improbably set in sweet spots that allow for the possibility of life. Outside of those sweet spots, life would be impossible in our universe. And some of the physicists who first discovered this, one of whom was a very staunch scientific atheist, Sir Fred Hoyle, changed his whole worldview because of this discovery. He said the fine tuning suggests a fine tuner. And a lot of physicists have seen that that's, as Hoyle put it, the common sense interpretation of why we have this improbable array of parameters that fall within these narrow tolerances outside of which, again, life would be impossible. What are the odds? They're infinitesimally small. Looks like the universe was a setup job to allow for the possibility of life. Well, an alternative hypothesis is, well, no, maybe there's like a billion other universes out there that are, um, and ours just happens to be the lucky one. And um, and I this is directly relevant to the thesis I developed in Return to the God Hypothesis, because I compare the explanatory power of the multiverse hypothesis to the theistic design hypothesis. And I show that even if there are multiverses out there, um, you still have prior unexplained fine tuning in what are called the universe generating mechanisms that are needed to, to produce those other universes. And here's the problem. Even if we, if we just have other universes, but they're not causally connected to our own, then nothing that happens in those other universes affects anything that happens on our in our universe, including whatever processes, the probabilities associated with what other processes are responsible for the fine tuning parameters to have arisen in the just right way that they did. And so therefore there must be some to, to talk for there to be, uh, for the multiverse to explain why the fine tuning exists and is so improbable, there must be some sort of common cause that produces all the universes a, some universe generating mechanisms that allows us to portray our universe as a lucky winner in some kind of giant cosmic lottery. And that's where the rub comes in because all the universe generating mechanisms that have been proposed themselves require prior unexplained fine tuning to account for their ability to generate new universes. And so yeah, you end up going right back to where you started with unexplained prior fine tuning, suggesting the need for a fine tuner. 
Yeah, and also with the multiverse theory is hard for me to to wrap my head around because um, let's say these other universes did have a different cosmological constant. So the parameters you're talking about, you mean things like the cosmological constant. Cosmological right? constant, the, the strength I, of gravitational yeah, constant. I mean, the, yeah, um, the weak force, the, the strong the, force, like all of these very yeah. specific things. Mass that, of the quark, et cetera, yeah. Right. Um, they have to be... They have to be exact. We're not sure why they are the number that they are. We're not sure why the speed of light is, is why the speed of light is, but it is. Could be and, otherwise, but it isn't. And it's important and, and that it so, is just what it is. Yeah. And so to me, that, that would mean that if other universes didn't have those same set of rules, that they would basically collapse into nothingness and therefore not exist, which is why I'm like, I don't think they can exist. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe they maybe they existed for a, you know a, a split nanosecond, um, and 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 I and it kind of gets back to the the quantum theory aspect of this because as I understand it, most of these, if you subscribe to that theory, most of these other universes sort of collapse in on themselves and then cease to exist entirely. Doesn't mean they don't keep getting created, but there's only one that can actually function. I don't even know if I mean now we're just now we're just off in theory. Well, it, physics, dep it but... depends on the it depends on the parameters, but many of the parameters have to be set just right for to avoid our universe just uh, becoming a black hole. If the cosmological constant is off by one part ninetieth power, too and it's too strong by that little smidge, the universe recollapses and we have a black hole. Many of the parameters have to be set just right so we can have even basic chemistry. So if mm -hmm. you want to say, well, life evolved in accord with the fine tuning parameters that existed. That's uh, our uh, interlocutor of mine, uh, Lawrence Krauss, has said that that actually doesn't work because you don't even get the evolutionary process going unless you have prior fine tuning of an exquisite degree of many of the parameters. So, and there has um, to be a fine tuner. Yeah, there has to be a fine tuner. And the, the configuration of mass energy at the beginning is one of the most exquisitely is the most exquisitely finely tuned things. They call that the initial entropy, and it's crazy fine tuned. So it's a it's a real it's a it's a conundrum for materialistic physicists, but it's something that seems to lead very naturally to the conclusion of intelligent design and an intelligent design active from the very beginning of the universe. No space alien could account for this intelligent design because the, the fine tuning has to be set for the, any kind of evolutionary process to arise that, that would produce a space alien. Right. And then, yeah. And it just, it, and you haven't solved anything if there's a space alien, because how did they come about? So exactly. Um, fascinating conversation. I do, I do have to run. Uh, Dr. Meyer, thanks so much for, for being on. I can see, yes, I can see why I, this could have gone three hours with Joe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, thank you for the great questions. Yeah. Well, appreciate you being on. This was fantastic.